In our last episode, we retrieved some of the Brotherhood's missing weapons that were being held by the settlers at Foundation. Their inexperience with the weapons led to a great disaster, but hopefully the training that the Brotherhood will be providing to the settlers will help prevent future disasters. But of course, we had to choose that outcome. It's also possible that we alienated the settlers. Either way, we began the quest over and out. We need to re-establish contact with the Brotherhood on the West Coast. And it seems like Scribe Valdez has a few ideas. Checking in with her. Have you talked to the others recently? I've been trying to get a moment with them, but things are still so busy. Seems our time slots never align. As a matter of fact, they just sent me to come get you. Then it's my lucky day. Come with me. With that, she crosses the catwalk and heads on over to Knight Shin and Paladin Romani. Paladin, Knight, you'll want to hear this. I picked up a low-frequency signal in the area. It's weak, but I'm close to narrowing down the coordinates. If we can find and boost the source of that signal, we might be able to use it to get in touch with California. That's excellent news, Scribe Valdez. Follow up with me as soon as you have the coordinates. What's this about? I thought I made it clear that our first priority is strengthening our presence in Appalachia. My apologies, Paladin. The Knight kept talking about Elder Maxon's orders, so I set up a signal tracer to run in the background. It was my own initiative. This isn't a field trip, Paladin. When we left, Elder Maxon ordered us to restore communications as soon as we arrived in Appalachia. You've delayed that order long enough. Since our arrival, every last ounce of my effort has gone toward establishing the Brotherhood as an effective force of action in Appalachia. Everything we've done here has been necessary. And before Valdez's report, we had no leads on a long-distance communicator. We would still have no leads if it were up to you. Enough, Shin. We have a lead now. Let's focus on that. You said you're close to tracking down the signal, Valdez? Why don't we have our reliable initiate assist you? Okay. I'll be in my workshop when you're ready. Ooh, kinda sounds like uh, Paladin Romani isn't too cool. pleased about Valdez's initiative here. But at this point, we can talk with her about some of our previous assignments. Do you have any questions about your duties? How are the Putnams doing? George Putnam came by with a basket of homegrown tatoes as a token of his family's appreciation. He reminded me his sons were interested in joining our ranks. Maybe one day we can send someone to see if they're Brotherhood material. An odd thing to say considering we've already recruited one of the brothers. Interestingly, she only says that if we recruit Marty, if we recruit Colin, she appears to know that we've done so. I was pleased to tell him what a boon Colin has been as an assistant to Scribe Valdez. Have you heard anything from the retreat? There have been no more threats from Blood Eagles. Even so, the nearby swamp creatures give the villagers trouble from time to time. They don't have much in the way of self-defense. As such, we must strive to expand the Brotherhood's reach across Appalachia and make it a safe home for settlements such as theirs. However, she says something different if we gave one of the rocket launchers to the retreat. And, despite Shin's objection, the villagers have been able to use the weapon you provided to fend off a number of attacks from nearby creatures. That kind of resourcefulness is exactly what I'd like to see in a united wasteland. Great. If we continue to trust and work together with the people of Appalachia, we are sure to create a safer home for everyone. How's the Brotherhood's relationship with the settlers? The trade deal you established has been of immense benefit to us. All the time our initiates would have spent gathering supplies, we've been able to direct toward training and reconnaissance. If this is what results of putting you in charge of negotiations, we'll have to do so more often. Interestingly, she says this even if she previously scolded us for demanding the weapons from the settlers using strong-handed tactics. What more can you tell me about the Brotherhood? If you have any additional questions about your duties, Knight Shin is in charge of new recruits. What's the Brotherhood doing in Appalachia? First and foremost, our mission is to restore society and preserve any technology that will assist us in that goal. In addition, we are currently investigating what happened to the previous Brotherhood members from Fort Defiance. It is important that we establish a new foothold here, 
which will allow us to aid the people of Appalachia. What technology should we focus on first? As you know, the Ultrasight battery discovered underneath Atlas is a promising development. Anything else that the Brotherhood could use to expand our capabilities would be of merit to our mission. A new foothold? Was the Brotherhood of Steel here already? Yes. There was a unit here led by Paladin Taggarty. We lost contact with the group shortly before their mission to attack the Scorched, and we are unsure of their fate. Regardless of what may have occurred, their selfless courage is commendable. If we've completed the primary plot and we know what happened to Paladin Taggarty, we can tell her Paladin Taggarty was killed in action during Operation Touchdown. That is... very sad to hear. Although not at all surprising. We feared the worst after we lost contact with her. I knew Paladin Taggarty back when she was lieutenant. Good woman. I have no doubt in my mind that she led the Appalachian chapter admirably. I'd like to make my way to Fort Defiance personally at some point to pay my respects. Those soldiers deserve some remembrance for giving their lives to protect this region. What made you want to join the Brotherhood? My mission in life is to help others and restore order to the world. The Brotherhood of Steel is aligned with those goals, in addition to the preservation of technology. I will be on the forefront of rebuilding society. What is your role? As the Paladin, I am the commander of this unit, and I'm here to establish a foothold for the Brotherhood of Steel. It is important that we restore society. And the steps that you have already made here in Appalachia are admirable. However, without the power of the Brotherhood, you will be unable to prevail. I am eager to lend that power. I'd like to get to know you better. You arrived in Appalachia. Social conversations with a superior officer are not appropriate, soldier. I won't tell if you won't. Where are you from? I'm originally from the California branch of the Brotherhood of Steel. I was posted near Mariposa before the bombs fell, and I learned that some members of the U.S. military had created an organization to no help people. Approved. As a member of the U.S. military, joining up with the Brotherhood was a natural transition for me. What branch of military were you in? I was in the National Guard. Helping those who are less fortunate has always been a passion of mine. Being able to help protect my community was an experience I'll never forget. But now, my mission is to protect you and the other people of Appalachia. Who leads the Brotherhood in California? High Elder Roger Maxson is our leader back in California, and is the person who sent us on our mission to Appalachia. Let's talk about Appalachia. It's a beautiful land, and the people are resourceful. We will do everything we can to support them. Everyone here needs to get inoculated, or else you'll turn into Scorched. All of us have taken the inoculation, but thank you for inquiring. It means a lot to me that the people of Appalachia care for the well-being of others. What do you think of the groups that have settled here? They've done well to build such capable communities on the broken bones of the old world. Foundation is charming, and I admire their workmanship. The people of Crater may be more complicated, but I refuse to judge their group based on our past encounters with raiders. Over time, I'd like to build a lasting relationship with both of these settlements. You know it's pronounced Appalachia, right? Ah, did I slip up again? Old habits die hard. I hope you'll be patient with us Westerners as we learn the local vernacular. I gotta go. Stay safe. Oh, don't worry about it, Paladin. I'm sure she'll get the pronunciation down soon. Heading downstairs, we can talk to Shin. Are you following your regiment? And he has quite a few new things to say after everything we've done for him. Can we talk about the Raiders? I'd rather not waste my breath on that topic, so make it quick. Any thoughts on Pierce? You mean that vile man we dealt with at the storeroom? The next time he tries to wax poetic about brotherhood tyranny and how he's trying to protect his family, any family that threatens others to protect itself is just a criminal mob. And the way that Pierce tries to twist his words around you to justify himself, it's repulsive. Paladin Romani mentioned you have a history with the Raiders. And I mentioned I'd rather not talk about it. But, since you're so insistent on being intrusive, Nightconners defended my hometown from Raiders. 
and subsequently brought me into the fold. I've seen raiders threaten and destroy communities a number of times, not just my own. As such, I believe it is within the Brotherhood's mission to address the threat they pose to humanity. Why can't we all just get along? Because the raiders are undignified outlaws who lie, steal, and murder as they see fit. Their existence is a direct obstacle to the Brotherhood's mission to save humanity. That's why we can't just get along. We can pass a raider check to say, the raiders are pretty cool, huh? If by cool you mean foul, violent, shameless, bereft of any kind of morals, that's not a funny joke initiate. Raiders have taken the lives of many of our brethren. We must regard them as a serious threat. Hey, when can I become a knight? When you sufficiently demonstrate your effectiveness as an initiate and your dedication to our mission. Making yourself useful instead of pestering me about your official title would be a good start. After exhausting all of his new dialogue, we can head back to Scribe Valdez. I don't suppose you know how to spot weld. Sorry you had to see that. Let's get down to business, shall we? If we can find the source of the signal I detected, we should be able to use it to send a message to Elder Maxon on the West Coast. I tracked the signal to an area northwest of Vault 76. You'll need to go and check it out in person. Maybe you'll get lucky. But I suspect the source of the transmission won't be easy to find. Devices that transmit at this frequency are rare. The only ones I know of were built at advanced military facilities. You said the signal was weak. Will it still work? I'm glad you asked. It may not work in its current state, but... Do you remember what we found in the Atlas substructure? An incredibly powerful compact ultrasite battery cell. With one of those, we could easily boost the transmitter back to its full function. Lucky for us, I've just managed to reverse engineer the cell. Think of this as its final test. Why couldn't we use some other transmitter? Because other transmitters don't reach that far. The one they were using at Fort Defiance is out of commission. Permanently. But low frequency signals like the one I'm detecting, they travel incredible distances, even passing through mountains and oceans without a hitch. During wartime, they were used to transmit signals to submarines. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Who's Elder Maxon? Oh, <laughs> have we not explained that to you yet? It should have been part of your initiation. <laughs> Guess we just haven't had a chance to slow down. Sorry about that. Above the Paladins are the Elders. And leading the Elders is High Elder Maxon. He's the one who founded the Brotherhood and decided to send us on our mission here. Why is Shin so concerned with contacting Elder Maxon? It was one of our orders. After setting up in Appalachia, we were to re-establish contact, make a report, and receive our next assignment. It's not that the Paladin has directly disobeyed that order, but... She's been more focused on helping Appalachia. Being in that position as the leader of this whole operation, I can't even imagine how much she has to think about. I'm just trying to support both her and the Knight as much as I can, and hopefully get them back on the same page. What's going on with Romani and Shin? After all you've done for us, I suppose you deserve an answer. Their relationship has been rocky since a certain incident on our journey here. It's kind of a sensitive topic for everyone. I thought they'd be able to work things out over time, but it's only gotten worse. I'm honestly kind of worried. But maybe contact with Elder Maxon will get them back on track. I'll find the transmitter. Stay safe out there. We'll be right on your tail. With that, our quest log updates to locate the transmitter facility. We see that the signal is coming from a location northwest of Vault 76. As we approach the signal, we see that it's coming from a nearby broadcast tower. This is Transmission Station 1ATU03. And before Steel Dawn, this place was very different. The door to the station was gone, and outside was a lone wanderer motorcycle. Inside, we found a tinkerer's workbench and a table with a revolver next to a note. Note to Sugar Plum. Sugar Plum, I'm headed down to the lakeside to see if I can scrounge up some food and water. I'm taking Pumpkin with me. We should be back by noon. Hopefully, I'll be back before you wake up. Love, Papa's. There was a crib right by the table, and on the other side of the room was a bed without a mattress and a woman's skeleton splayed atop it. There were a few containers, including an industrial trunk, 
a fedora and a greaser jacket and jeans on a nearby shelf, and a potential magazine wedged between two boxes on the bottom. The note is odd because there isn't a lake nearby. There's a river nearby, and on the shore of the river we don't find anything that could be papas or pumpkin. And presumably the skeleton lying in bed is that of Sugar Plum. It looks as if he either didn't get back at all, or when he got back, she was dead. Though maybe it's a bit darker than that. We found the revolver on the desk, right next to where he left the note. So we're to believe that this guy went off to scrounge for food and left his weapon behind. It could be that Sugar Plum had already died, perhaps of starvation or exposure, and instead of facing life without her, he chose to leave his weapon behind, go off into the wilderness, and die. At any rate, this story is now gone. The note is gone, the entire interior has changed. Instead, when we arrive at Transmission Station 1ATU03, we find a few mole rats. <laughs> Once the mole rats are dead, we can creep closer only to find an enclave corpse? What? On his body is a note. And by looting it, we discover transmission station 1ATU03. Urgent request. Someone needs to get up here ASAP. We have a serious security issue. A couple of scavs came poking around last night and waltzed right through the laser grid. My best guess is that the storm knocked the power out and completely reset the system. I may just be a security guard, but shouldn't this have been tested? For crying out loud, we have a circuit breaker just outside the building. I'm gonna need backup if someone with real firepower tries to get in here. Uh, what? Is this more than a broadcast tower? Right above the corpse is the circuit breaker he was talking about. And opening it, we can flip it. That apparently unlocks this security gate on the other side. On the wall beside the door, we read, No trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So this is a pre-war facility with a hand scanner outside. It appears to take any handprint. This character has not joined the Enclave yet. Inside, we find an access hatch leading to one of those transport tubes, like the ones we found at AMS Corporate Headquarters. There's not much scrap here, some ammunition and a 44 caliber pistol. When ready, we can activate the access hatch to enter the Enclave Research Facility. We arrive on a platform overlooking a large room. The platform has minor scrap. We find a Nuka-Cola in the Nuka-Cola machine. Heading down the stairs from the platform, we see that this absolutely huge room has an enclave sigil emblazoned on the ground. And stepping closer, we begin a conversation with Sodas? Task 151-977, J. Rodriguez. Lower temperature to 20 degrees Celsius in the lab. Task complete. Please verify. Task queue interrupted. It seems as though we have a visitor. Welcome to Enclave Research Facility Site J. May I ask the reason for your visit today? You're not going to try and kill me, are you? Negative. My creators programmed me to assist visitors with extreme kindness and hospitality. I have some questions. Very well. Answering questions is one of my secondary functions. It would be inhospitable of me not to comply. Who are you? My name is SOTUS, Single Operation Direction and Utility System. I help run this facility. What is this place? This is the research center of the Enclave's Appalachia Division. Additional information is classified. What happened to the residents here? They're still around. You will find most of them in the cafeteria area. We find the following option only if we are a member of the Enclave after doing the primary quest. Have you been in contact with the White Spring Bunker? Not for many years now. That know-it-all, Modus, claimed to have no use for this facility anymore and cut all communications. 
that's enough for now. Very well. Attention, citizens. Was there anything else Nuclear I can assist you with? We detected a transmission coming from this facility. We need access to your transmitter. Interesting. Not like the others. Very well. Task entered. Estimated wait time, 14,320 hours, 12 minutes. That's ridiculous. We need access now. I do apologize. But you must wait in the queue with everyone else. Is there any other way for us to gain access? You may manually activate the transmitter via the communication center. However, I do not recommend that. It is a very long walk. In the meantime, if you wish to tour the facility, please enter decontamination to your left. Oh, great. Looks like we get to explore an abandoned enclave research facility run by a crazy robot. Fun. We see a hallway to the left, bathed in green light, and, well, looks like that's a bunch of bodies. Uh, yeah, that's an ominous sight. And if we accidentally touch the water coming out of the decontamination arches, we take rads. My apologies. There appears to be a malfunction with the decontamination showers. Entering task to investigate. Don't think I want to go down there. Turning around first, we can try to explore behind us. We find a coffee nook over here with pots of coffee, sugar, coffee cups, board games. There's a small reception desk over here with minor scrap. And sandwiched between them is a door that we can't access. In the wall behind the reception desk is a big window overlooking some large facility of some sort. We see consoles and what appears to be large vats back there. Well, with the western door inaccessible and no way forward to the south, looks like we have to go east. We've got three options. The door to the right is closed and it's locked with this hand scanner on the wall. If we try to activate it, we see that we don't have permission. So this way is blocked. The door to the left is locked with a skill level zero lock, but just outside there is also a terminal locked with a skill level zero lock. After hacking it, we don't find any lore, we just find the option to unlock the door. Inside we find what appears to be a control room for the rad scrubbers. We find some rad away, some minor scrap, a first aid kit on the wall, and a door with a button that we can activate to put ourselves on the other side of the rad scrubbers. Looks like we found a way through. Before heading through, we can finish exploring this decontamination control room. On the primary console, we find a note lying on the clipboard. Decontamination note. Enclave Research Division. This is ridiculous. I don't know why we need this station manned 24 hours a day. The only people that come through here anymore are the scouts. They know the deal. They return. I put in a task to fire up the decontamination showers. They wait. I can't help it if Soda says there's a three-hour queue. Doesn't stop them from giving me crap every single time. So the Enclave was keeping tabs on post-nuclear war Appalachia using scouts who would come back to this research facility, presumably with details of what they had learned. But with so few visitors, why would this SOTUS bog down their return with a three-hour queue? Seems counterproductive. Giving the room a final scan to see what we find. A lunch pail and coffee supplies on a counter. In one of the shelves, we do see a little display. It appears to be a panda bear performing some sort of lab experiment on a toy alien. But the door is partially closed and it's hard to see. The rest of the containers are all empty. So heading through the door, we can arrive on the other side of the rad scrubbers. Moving forward, we go down a staircase. Task 151978R Wiggins. Turn on the goddamn lights in the living quarters. Task complete. Please verify. Huh. So sounds like the residents who lived here, the Enclave employees and soldiers who lived here, would speak audible commands to Sodas that she would then enter as tasks in her queue. Opening the door at the end of the hallway, here we find a bunch of green gas. Oh, there's been some sort of 
explosion or leak or something. But even though this looks really alarming, the gas doesn't appear to harm us. We are not picking up rads. We're not getting diseased or anything else. After exploring the containers on this platform, we can hazard a step down towards the giant tubes below. And here we see a bunch of creatures floating in these suspension tubes. But we don't have long to wonder at them. Warning, biological hazard detected in the research lab. Please evacuate immediately. Uh-oh, uh, what did that mean? Is Sotus just now realizing there's some sort of green gas in this room? Our quest log updates, we need to escape the deadly gas. But again, it's not very deadly, this gas. My character isn't wearing a hazmat suit or a gas mask or anything, which kind of takes the fear out of this encounter. But I'm not gonna complain. Any day where I don't have to deal with deadly gas is a good day. After exploring the room for all of its scrap, we see a couple of ways forward. To the north is a little room with a door and an eastern wall, and to the east is a staircase that leads up to two other doors. One in the eastern wall, one in a northern wall. The eastern door is locked with a skill level zero locked terminal. Let's try to access this smaller room over here, which has two doors. Opening the southern door first, we find a rad roach. No. But uh, it dies as soon as we enter the room. The rad roach, descendant from a cockroach, which is famous for being able to survive almost everything, dies to this gas. But we're fine. Cool. By the rad roach is a big red button. Around us are some lab tables and tubes. A sign on the wall says incinerator with an arrow pointing down. Here we find a hatch that we can manually open. Ooh. And does the button work? It does. Fancy that. Okay, so we could hop down this hatch to explore the room below, but I kind of wanted to see how we naturally progress through this facility. So we can start by looting this room. As a medical research facility, there's a ton of tools and scalpels and microscopes and lab equipment. There is a dead rad stag on a table here that has been splayed open as if the scientists had been examining it. Directly behind it is a cave cricket. We get an impression that the enclave scientists of this facility were doing research on post-apocalyptic mutated life forms. Opening the northern door, we see that it's just that door we saw from the other room, so these two doors lead to the same room. On a wall, we find some detailed notes about a Myrler hunter. It has detailed drawings about this hunter and some scientific sketches, apparently theorizing on how this thing evolved or mutated from a lobster. In some tanks nearby, we find Myrler catchlings, and that's about it for this room. We could open the hatch and hop down to join that big mess of gore down there, but instead we'll head back out and hack this skill level zero terminal to open the door. The door opens. We step into a dimly lit room, overlooking another lab with more suspension tanks. As we creep closer... Run away! Task 151979G, Walton. Feed the giant moth subject before it gets upset. Error. Moth subject missing. Oh, I think I found your moth subject. Yikes. But uh, the mothman apparently didn't want to fight. It disappeared. He never came back to fight me, but I did end up having to fight him to the death when I came here during my live stream. This room has a number of wasteland creatures suspended in these tubes, and each of these collections of tubes on platforms is labeled. This one over here is labeled Z03, and it appears to be two Wendigos suspended in these tanks. There is a third tank here, but it's empty. We find a security door to the south that's broken. We can't get out that way. We find another platform with more tubes over here. It clearly contains a gulper, but the pedestal isn't labeled. We don't know what number this would have been. We do find a fusion core lying on this platform. After looting some scrap in this room, we find a door in the northeastern wall. This appears to lead to a maintenance section. We arrive on a platform with a first aid kit on a wall and scrap on shelves against the western wall. 
We can take some stairs down from the platform to reach what appears to be an incinerator room. We find rolling carts filled with mole rats, Mirelurk hatchlings, Mirelurk eggs, and big, huge incinerators, furiously ablaze. If we get too close, we do get burned. These suckers are hot. Against the western wall is a weapons workbench. All right, at least I won't get too encumbered. Peering down to the bottom floor, we find a body under a shelf. Oh god, let's get a closer look at that. It's an enclave corpse. Something terrible happened here. Are there any enclave research scientists left alive? On a platform above us, we see the end of a chute. Taking the stairs up that way, we find a Brahmin corpse, more incinerators, and then a pile of corpses. Peering up, sure enough, we see the chute. Through the chute, we see the lab room above. Had we jumped down it, we would have arrived in this room. All right, well, we know where this room connects to. So, so far, we're not lost. Back into the room with the suspension tanks. We see that our only way forward is to open a door in the southwestern wall. This leads to another lab with a big exam table in the middle of the room. Against the southern wall is a window leading to a terrarium, I guess. Here we find frog eggs, brain fungus, and mutated plants. We see that this display is labeled Z04. Wow, these Enclave guys are really putting together quite a collection. After looting all of the scientific equipment here, we reach the western room where we see a label Z05. But the door is busted. What did they keep in here? Peering through a crack in the door, we see cables and pipes dangling from the ceiling. The ground appears to be covered in dirt and... Are those ashes? There is metal shrapnel leading away from the door, as if some great force batted against it. There is a button on the wall that we can use to activate the shutters, and we can peer inside, but the room is dark and empty. What did they keep in here? Well, if we look closely, and it helps to have a scope, we can see the body of an alien lying in here. It's been dead for some time. We find flies buzzing around its head. But how did he die? The door shows signs that it was tampered with. Did they just kill him? Or did this alien die trying to escape? We find a hazmat suit on a console here. But again, we probably don't need one as we are not actually feeling any effects from the gas. And on the exam table is a laser rifle with fusion cells. This exam table is interesting. There appears to be some sort of a laser or sonic cutter pointing at the table, and there's a big spatter of goo all over it. Ugh. I suppose we can presume that they splattered an alien on this table, but with a laser rifle? Because aliens don't wield laser rifles. So why is this here if they were examining an alien? After scrapping up at a chemistry station, we can take the staircase in this room up to the southwest. It turns a corner, heads north, and we come out through a door on a platform above. Here we find a Brahmin corpse in a cage. Oh, it's wriggling! Oh, oh, there's something inside! And if I were to hazard a guess, it would be bloatfly larva. But we can't actually get this thing to explode. No matter how many times we stab it, it just sits here and pulsates. Turning around, we see a door to the east and a console to the north, overlooking the room below. Activating the console first, we can read the lab console. Enclave Research Lab Console. Welcome to the Enclave Research Facility. All data contained herein is property of the Enclave Research Division. Any unauthorized duplication, modification, or transmission is strictly prohibited. We find five entries in the first subject, Z01. Error, data corrupted. We haven't found anything labeled Z01 just yet. In the next one, subject Z02. Sample retrieved from a lagoon west of the Thunder Mountain power plant. Appears to be a descendant of the humble salamander. Okay, so even though the tube was unmarked, the one with the gulper inside must have been Z02. In the next, subject Z03. Five samples retrieved from the Mononga area appears to be of human origin. However, tests show the presence of DNA from multiple different individuals in each subject. While attempting to retrieve the subjects, two scouts were killed in action. Could prove to be useful as a weapon if we can figure out how to control them. 
This, of course, is talking about the Wendigo we saw on display. And as we learned by completing the primary plot to Fallout 76, the Wendigo evolved and mutated from humans who became cannibals, thus explaining the multiple different types of human DNA in each subject. And we find a motive for why the Enclave are doing so much research on post-apocalyptic fauna. It looks like even now they're trying to build an army, and they're trying to find the best natural quote-unquote creatures that they can use in this army. A modus operandi that Eden's Enclave will attempt to do with death claws hundreds of years later. And the next one, Z04. Eggs retrieved from the area surrounding Harper's Ferry appear to be of amphibian origin. Attempts to incubate have been unsuccessful. This is the window terrarium we saw with the eggs inside. And the final one, Z05. Error, data redacted. Destroy subjects immediately. Z05 was the room with the shutters and the broken door. I suppose it's no wonder why the Enclave redacted any information they had on captive aliens. That's it for this lab console. Turning east, we see broken lab equipment and spatter on the ground. There is a door labeled Exit. We'll come this way in a second. But I was distracted by a noise I heard coming from a nearby wall. It was the sound of a sign changing, and we can take a closer look to examine it. Cell status, Z01, Breach. Z02, Slumber. That was the Gulper. Z03, Dreams. That was the Wendigo. Z04, Inert. Those were the frog eggs, and Z05 deceased. Wow. Oh, so that's why the room looks destroyed. That's why we see what appears to be ash in the bottom of the room. They must have somehow incinerated the aliens that were in that room. But the sign, it keeps going. Cell status, AO1, empty. AO2, awake. AO3, hunger. AO4, thirst. AO5, empty. AO6, thirst. And it keeps going, cell status. BO1 awake, BO2 loud, BO3 empty, BO4 aware, BO5 empty, BO6 awake. And on to C. Cell status, CO1 anger, CO2 deceased, CO3 breach, CO4 content. Oh, that's some good news, I guess. And here it begins to cycle through again. Okay, so we've got cells Z, A, B, and C. We are exploring Z-Wing now. God, I wonder what's waiting for us in A, B, and C. Turning around, we complete the Z-Wing, for here is Z-01. The door has been blasted out of the wall. This is why the sign said that Z-01 escaped. And creeping in, we learn what Z-01 was. It was the Mothman. Here we find Mothman eggs all over the place. All right, so Z05 is dead. We don't need to worry about it. The Wendigo and the Gulper are sleeping. We don't need to worry about them. We've just got this Mothman loose. Continuing down the catwalk, we arrive at a platform to the north. We find the door that we came in through against the northwestern wall and the ramp leading back down to the ground floor with the suspension tanks. So heading back upstairs, our only way forward is to go back through the door labeled Exit by the terminal we read. We find a large hallway with lockers. The lockers have scrap and foodstuffs. We find shelves covered in boxes, a couple of vending machines. And at the end, we find a large room with a couple of doors, a tea and coffee nook in the wall to the west, a broken door in the wall to the northeast. And when ready, we can open the double doors in the wall to the south. This leads to another platform overlooking, uh, cells? Task zero. Zero, zero, unknown user. Priority one, open all cells in the holding area. Four doors open and four enemies crawl out. A scorched Wendigo on the top platform, a bloat fly from the top middle door, a tick from the bottom left door, and a scorched blood bug from the bottom right door. <laughs> Oh, nasty. But that appears to be it. Heading down the stairs, we can loot the corpses and then examine each of these cell rooms. The bottom right, the one that the blood bug came out of, 
is labeled A06, but the inside of the cell is empty. The cell status on the wall for this one read uh, thirsty. Moving out, we can loot some various scrap and containers and then examine the other doors. The middle bottom door is labeled A05. We can open the shutters to peer inside and it looks like the room is partially destroyed. We see a petrified corpse against a wall and a few more through to the cell on the other side. The cell status for this one was empty. The door is locked with a skill level one lock. Unlocking it, we don't find much else we couldn't see through the window. With the back wall broken, we can move on to an adjacent cell, which likewise has more petrified corpses inside. Opening the door, we see this leads to B-Wing. We'll go ahead and turn around, finish exploring A-Wing first before moving on to B-Wing. On the far left, the one that the tick came out of is labeled A04. This one is likewise empty. The cell status for this one was thirst. Then there are the three cells above us. There's no way to get up there from here unless we have a jetpack. But we know what was in here. A03 had the scorched Wendigo. It was labeled hunger. The room itself is empty, aside from pools of blood on the ground. A02 had the bloat fly. It was labeled awake. The room itself is empty. And then A01 didn't open. We have to jump up there using a jetpack and then unlock a skill level one lock to get inside. Inside, we find the remains of a scorched, vicious wolf. There's an enclave corpse lying in the corner with an ammo box at his feet and a gun in his hand. This leads to the next cell, which has another enclave corpse and a door that leads to B-Wing. We'll explore B-Wing in a bit so we can head back out to the main room. This cell was labeled empty. With the cells explored, we can move east. Peering through a window, we see something nasty lying on a counter in there. Opening the door, we arrive in a large lab. To the left is a broken terrarium with logs and water. This one is unlabeled. Perhaps it was for beavers. We find a Mirelurk egg on display in a case. A first aid kit on a wall. And the big meaty blob we saw through the window is a dead Snallygaster lying on this exam table. It's all splayed out with its tongue extended and lying on the countertop next to it is a note. Snallygaster. What in the unholy heck is this thing? Every single test we've run has come back inconclusive. If this is what the world is like up top now, I think I'll just stay down here. Can't say that I blame the guy, though it looks like things didn't work out for him down here. On a surgical tray nearby is some digested goo. We'll find a couple of containers back here, but that's about it. Exploring the rest of the lab, we find a lot of circuitry and hardware lying about here, as well as at least one stealth boy. Then moving east, we find a door out. Task 151980D Evans. Raise temperature in the lab to 22 degrees Celsius. Task complete. Please verify. That's 71.6 degrees Fahrenheit, if you're curious. There's an i sack sitting on a scale, and after looting an IV bag and a first aid kit, we can open the door to proceed into the next room. We arrive at B-Wing, on the other side of those cells, and as soon as we enter, the doors to B-Wing open up. That was a cave cricket, an ant, and a rad rat. Since we came from the side, it was impossible to see which cells they came out of. Looks like there may be something else out there, but we don't see it quite yet. Turning around, we find the holding cell terminal in a console. Welcome to the Enclave Research Facility. All data contained herein is property of the Enclave Research Division. Any unauthorized duplication, modification, or transmission is strictly prohibited. Warning, data corruption detected. Operating in fragment mode. We find six entries. In the first, August 31st, 2084, 106 p.m., D. Evans. Task 39,843. Prepare subject in cell B03 for examination. B03, according to the wall, was empty. In the next one, on the same day, at 4.42 p.m., also by D. Evans, cancel task 39,843. I'll just do it myself. Whoop. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Okay. Looks like it was a mole miner we were missing. After looting the corpse, we can head back to the terminal. Let's see, where were we? Yeah, we just read D. Evans. I'll just do it myself. In the next one, September 1st, 2084, 36 minutes afternoon, by G. Walton. Exterminate subject in cell A5. A5 was the one we found locked, and when we picked the lock, it was empty, save for a petrified corpse. In the next one, September 2nd, 2084, the very next day at midnight, by unknown user. Error. Data not found. In the next one, on the same day, at 1.33 p.m., by R. Wiggins, emergency lockdown in cell block B. On the same day, at 2.42 p.m., by unknown user, error, data not found. What did this unknown user do that caused Wiggins to issue an emergency lockdown in cell block B? On some desks in the middle of the room are a series of broken terminals. Lying between two terminals is the note, terminals aren't safe. I don't think it's safe to leave each other notes on our terminals anymore. Remember how I was telling you I was going to find us something special in the supply room last night? Well, I went to go get it, but my access had been revoked. Better just stick to pen and paper from now on. JJ. Someone was snooping on their communications? On a private enclave terminal? Heading up the stairs, we can explore this elevated area. Sure enough, we do find a beaver in a display case. There's another terrarium against the wall with more beavers and vegetation inside. Everything is dead. Turning south, we find another case with a hatchling inside. Still no idea what it's a hatchling of. Perhaps the West Virginian rock? We see a door in the southern wall beneath another one of those signs, but before moving forward, we can examine the cells in cell block B. We'll start with B06. This one is empty, save for a crate. The sign listed this one as awake. The next is B05. This one didn't open when we came in, and on this side, it's locked with a skill level zero lock. So if we didn't unlock it by going through A05 earlier, we can easily unlock it now. And it's the same story. A bunch of petrified corpses in here. The sign on the wall listed this one as empty. All we find in here for our troubles are a few chems, some right away, and a stim pack on a shelf. Heading out and turning right, we find B04. The door is open and the cell is empty. This one was labeled aware. I wonder why the sign made the distinction between awake and aware. Perhaps this one had the mole miner. Next, we need to explore the cells on the second floor. And the ramp leading up here is working, so we can actually get up here. B03 is still closed. Opening the shutters, we see that it's empty. This side is locked with a skill level zero lock. We see that it connects to the other room that we unlocked in A wing. Here again, we find the enclave corpses lying on the ground and that scorched, vicious wolf. The sign on the wall listed this as empty. Back to the catwalk, we can turn right to examine B02. This door is open. We got attacked by whatever was kept in here. We find a bucket, puddles of blood, and grass on the ground. The sign on the wall said that whatever was in here was loud. Maybe the cricket? Those doggone crickets are pretty loud. Finally, we can head out and examine the last cell, B01. But this one is also empty. It's larger than the others, though, with a bunch of crates everywhere and dirt and filth on the ground. The sign on the wall said that this one was awake. With the cells explored, we can go back down to the floor and head through the western door. Examining the sign on the wall, we see that it is updating as we explore the facility. We see that all of the cells in A wing are now open or have an error code because they're broken. The same is true for all of the cells in B wing, open or there's an error. But the cells in C wing are still full. We arrive in a lab with some familiar looking tubes and then we hear a familiar voice. Task 151981, K Jones. Increase barometric pressure in holding cell 2C to 2400 millibarts. Error. Unknown term. Millibarts. Please resubmit task. Uh, Sodus almost sounded like she thought the phrase millibart sounded funny. Are robots supposed to think things are funny? Uh, we don't get attacked by anything, so that's good. 
Hazard Angleite, we see that there are a bunch of large holding cells here. They don't have gates, so not sure what they would have kept inside, but we see evidence that something had been kept in there. Heading on up to the platform, we see that they had a bunch of Mirelurks and Mirelurk hunters kept up here. These tubes aren't labeled. Only one of them is broken. The rest all still have their contents. And on a nearby cart, we find a fusion core. On a table, by some broken computers in the middle of this room, we find the note, Mole Miners. Enclave Research Division, subject B06. I almost pity this one. The scouts recovered two of them from Welch. We suspect they were once the residents. They do appear to have a moderate amount of intelligence. However, upon the removal of the respiration device on one subject, it suffocated almost instantly. Further study may be worthwhile. Oh, well, this one tells us which cell the mole miner was in. It was in B06. That was the one simply labeled Awake. This lab ends at a door to the west. Heading through, we arrive at another large lab. We see strangler vines breaking through the glass of a terrarium to the right, labeled CO3. CO3 was labeled Breach on the wall, which makes sense because the strangler vines broke through the glass of the terrarium. And as we move towards the center of the room, where we find a rad scorpion on a dissection table, one of the cell doors opens. Uh-oh. And a death claw climbs out. Oh, great. Oh, and it's a scorched death claw, too. Time to use the musket. He's dead. I wonder how long he'd been in there. We find an enclave corpse draped over a railing near to where we found the rad scorpion. There are consoles and containers on this level, but nothing much else of note. We can explore the room in a counterclockwise fashion. Moving down from the platform, we can loot a first aid kit on a filing cabinet. We see another terrarium labeled CO2. It appears to have possums inside. CO2 was labeled deceased on the wall. This is right next to a chemistry station. Continuing counterclockwise, we see that the cell the death clock came from was C01. There is an enclave corpse lying just outside, and on her body is the holding cell keycard. And directly beneath this keycard is the note, Scout Letter, Enclave Research Division. I won't be returning. I've already arranged things with Williams. He should have already reported to the Colonel that I had an accident on our last run. These people treat us like crap. And for what? We risk everything to bring back these grotesque creatures for them to poke and prod. How many have we lost already? I can't lose you too. You know this world isn't entirely the hellscape we make it out to be. If you change your mind, you know where I'll be. Wes. It appears that she didn't change her mind. Did Wes make it out alive? Will we find this Wes roaming the wasteland? We see a skeleton lying on the ground inside cell C01. C01 was labeled anger on the wall. We find dead Brahmin in the corner. There is gore and filth everywhere, but we don't see much else inside. Heading out, however, and continuing counterclockwise, we find a switch on a wall just outside this cell. It's labeled feeding chute. Whoa! Heading back inside the cell, we see that a Yao Guai has fallen from the ceiling, as well as a Radstag yearling. If we use a jetpack to try to get up there, we hit an invisible wall. Heading back to the outside of C01, we find another feeding tube switch on the opposite side of the door. Flipping this one, moving inside we can examine, and yeah, it's an enclave body. How did this guy get stuck in there? On his body is the feeding chute note. How many times did I tell you guys we need a safety railing or some kind of damn ladder for the feeding chutes? I hate you guys. Stay the hell out of my footlocker. Walton. So this is the remains of G. Walton. Apparently he got stuck in the feeding chute somehow. And his last thoughts were to make sure people stayed out of his locker. On his body we also find Walton Footlocker Key. Well, guess we now have to keep our eyes open for this footlocker. The last thing we find here is 
terrarium C04. Inside, we find a chicken. Just one chicken. It's been clucking at us this entire episode. We don't find a way to access it. The wall labeled this guy as content. Well, at least someone is. With cell block C explored, we can leave by going up a staircase to the west and using the ID card reader to open the door. Stepping in. There you are. Welcome back. My apologies. My residents must have had a good reason to open all those cells at the time. And what could that reason be? I suppose we should delve deeper to find out. Moving clockwise around this room, we find a syringer on a table next to an ammo box, a first aid kit on a wall next to a broken door. On the opposite end of the room, some scrap, a lead pipe, and against the western wall, the cell block C console. We read what is by now a familiar boilerplate message at the top. We find five entries. We'll start with subject C01. The subject appears to be the product of very precise genetic manipulation. One of our own, maybe? We'll have to check with Wiggins to see if she can find any more information. Use extreme caution when attempting to examine. Power armor usage is highly recommended. CO1, of course, was the cell that the Deathclaw was in. Was this guy saying that he saw the Enclave's handiwork within the genetic code of the Deathclaw? In the next one, subject CO2, North American Possum. Pretty similar to the ones that used to live in my backyard, except for the three-head thing. That's kind of weird. They still seem to be garbage connoisseurs, though. In the next one, CO3, germinated seed pods from Tanagra Town. These vine-like organisms grow remarkably fast and were able to lift the entire town into the sky. Upon examination, our researchers noted a sense of euphoria and claimed to hear incomprehensible voices. Extreme measures will need to be taken to cull this organism to prevent it from spreading throughout the facility. These were, of course, the strangler vines we saw already crawling out of the cell. I did a video on Tanagra Town that you can watch here. In the next one, CO4, some chickens. They appear to be less mutated than other creatures we've come across. Looking at them is making me hungry. Maybe I'll spare this one from the incinerator. Pretty sure I saw some garlic and paprika in the supply room somewhere. I can't do another night of that pink crap again. This must be the terminal entry that JJ was talking about in his note, Terminals Aren't Safe. The something special he was talking about in the note that he was going to find in the supply room, we now know is garlic and paprika. So who had access to this terminal entry? And why would garlic and paprika be dangerous enough for them to lock JJ out of the storage room? In the last one, urgent, please read. Stay the hell out of cell block C. We were examining BO2 when subject CO1's doors suddenly opened. Evans and the scouts managed to get it back in its cell, but not before it killed them all. We are all gathering into the cafeteria. Something isn't right down here. So someone was reading their terminal entries and randomly opening cell doors? The only way out of this room is through the door to the southwest. Heading down the hallway and up a staircase, we arrive at another door to the southwest that leads us to another long hallway lined with boxes, crates, and coffee cups everywhere. Your nutrients must be running low. Please help yourself to any supplies you need. Uh, well, thank you, sodas, I guess. My nutrients are running low? Why does she care if I'm hungry? The door to the south is broken. But hanging out of it is an enclave corpse. This door was damaged recently. Our only way forward is through a door to the northwest. Opening it, we arrive in the cafeteria. We see a chef hat in the locker to the left and another enclave corpse with vomit pouring out of its mouth, lying next to a tray filled with pink paste. No, not pink paste. Heading up the stairs, we see a machine of some sort? Is this how they made the pink paste or dispensed it? Flies buzz above the machine and we see more trays of this pink paste on a table to the right. 
Was that nutrient talk Sotus's way of trying to encourage us to eat this pink paste? We find more trays of it lying all over the place. A skill level two locked security gate in the eastern wall, on the other side of which is another enclave corpse among more pink paste. Enclave corpses sit at cafeteria tables where they appear to have died mid-meal and they suffered a violent, sudden, and horrific death. Fallout 4 veterans will recognize this pink paste as appearing nearly identical to the food paste that the sole survivor finds in the Suffolk County Charter School. That pink paste was bland and tasteless, but it didn't kill the kids of the school. It was an experimental food program as part of the NAPP, the Nutritional Alternative Paste Program. The NAPP was actually part of a vault tech experiment this time taking place in a school with the permission of the U.S. government. Which makes me wonder why the government would also experiment with this pink paste on enclave officers who worked for the remnants of America's government. Of course, I suppose we could always believe that this pink paste is just different from the pink paste found at the Suffolk County Charter School. At any rate, we don't actually have an option to eat any of this pink paste, nor can we loot it. And so, we can leave by opening a door to the northwest. Heading down the staircase, we see a big enclave insignia above a door against the northwestern wall. And at the bottom of the stairs... Please forgive the mess. The residence became rather unruly after the accident. Unruly after the accident? Opening the door... Oh, scorched! Of course! Task one. G. Walton. Provide status of water recycling system. Duplicate issue. Ignore. Oh, that definitely sounded sinister. Was that dark humor? Sarcasm sodas? We begin to realize that all of the tragedies that befell these enclave soldiers were likely done by sodas. She was the one reading terminal entries and closing storage doors to keep soldiers from paprika. She was the one who opened cell C01 to release the death claw. And she was the one who apparently infected all of these people with the scorched plague. But how? How did she get the Scorched Plague down here? How did she know that the plague even existed above ground? And what's her motivation? We found others dead in the cafeteria who likely died to poisoning by Sodas after she poisoned their pink paste, but others trapped in doorways. How did all of these people die? This large battleground is sprawling with scrap everywhere and petrified corpses in every corner. On a wall, we find another one of those flickering signs. Visitor menu, but then it starts to get a bit garbled. For arms, eyes, torso, heart, spine, neck. Cafe menu, purge eyes together, ear, visicil, find, note, us, purify, fresh, eggs, hurt, sins. Huh, don't think I want to eat from that menu. What exactly is going on here? We explored most of the lower level while looting the bodies just after the fight. There are many staircases leading up to a second level. All we find of note on the bottom level is in a room by one of the staircases leading up. Here, under a lamp by a stool, is a lab journal. We've been down here for years. The work never ends. 
Every week the scouts come back with some new damned abomination, and every week we run our tests. Is it a mole? Is it a rat? Take your pick. I about throttled them when they brought back the crickets. Remember those summer nights when you couldn't sleep with a cricket chirping in the room? Yeah? Now imagine half a dozen of them, except they each weigh about 40 pounds. More evidence, I think, that the sign on the wall that read LOUD was referring to a cricket in B-Wing. We'll start by going up the staircase to the west. This platform just has more scrap, but it leads to a room which turns out to be a kitchen. Here we only find scrap, no notes or hollow tapes. A Voltec alarm clock on an upper shelf, cool. And only one container, a cooler. Heading back out to this upper level, we find a petrified corpse reaching for a Nuka-Cola machine. Interesting last moments. And a door leading to the exit to the west. We find a skill level one locked terminal just outside this door. But the door's open, so no need to hack it. The room adjacent to the store appears to be a game room. We find some arcade games here, and then a staircase leading back down to the ground floor, which we've already explored. But we also find a door leading out to the northeast. We again arrive on the second level overlooking the larger room below. There's some modern art on the wall, and a petrified corpse right next to a shadow against a wall. With the bottom explored and all top levels explored, our only option is to go through the door on the top level to the northwest by the skill level one lock terminal. This leads to laundry and we find a Braxo cleaner, stacks of linens, cardboard boxes, and another flickering sign on the wall. This one appears to be a scoreboard of some of the games the Enclave soldiers played here. Hoop shots, pinball, Zeta invader, Nuka tapper, high scores. But while we were distracted, a Scorched wandered into the hallway. What? Task 151983. J. Jefferson. Perform system-wide reset. Task denied. System operating as expected. There. J. Jefferson wanted to perform a system reset. That was JJ, the guy who figured out that Sodas was reading his terminal entries and was taking on a mind of her own. He tried to perform a system reset, but she denied it. She, after all, was operating as expected. This is the game room where many of those high scores were made. Moving through a broken wall, we arrive at a barracks. We find more petrified corpses here, a skill level three locked footlocker on the ground. But if we found Walton's footlocker key on his corpse when it fell down the food chute in cell C1, we can use that key to open this footlocker to find some high-level randomized stuff. Opening a door to the northwest, we arrive in a hallway, more doors arrayed in the wall directly opposite to us. But I didn't want to get turned around, so retracing our steps back through the game room, we can again arrive at this hallway to continue exploring northwest towards the direction of the scorch we shot. The first door to the right leads to another barracks. There's another broken wall. We find an empty footlocker beneath this bed. And behind this one, we find another interesting scene. Two bears sniffing glue. Ah, the blue bear seems to have been overcome by the glue. In the next room, a petrified corpse lying on the ground reaching for something. Two empty footlockers under this bunk as well. Under the next bunk, we find a footlocker with a minor scrap inside. And then opening the door, we arrive back at the hallway. There's the scorched we killed down the hallway. And turning left, we see the door that led to the game room to the left, and then two bathrooms to the right. In the first bathroom, we find a petrified corpse in one of the stalls. And then in the other stall, we see that we can actually peer through the floor. There's another level down there, and it appears to be flooded. We see water spilling into a pool below. And nearby, we find the source of that water. One of the urinals is leaking. It seems like the Enclave discovered this problem before they all died or turned to Scorched. There's a caution wet floor sign nearby, but the urinal is still leaking, even now. Yikes. Moving out, we can explore the next bathroom, and this was a shower. A petrified corpse in one of the showers. Some clothing, items, and soap, but that's about it. Moving out, we find a door to the south, and then another door to the east, right next to the one that led to the game room. This one locked with a skill level one lock. A petrified corpse stands directly before it. Opening it, we find a scorched. Moving inside, we find another barracks. 
There's an enclave corpse on a bunk bed with a bottle of Day Tripper by his hand. That's one way to go out. And then on a table between the bunks is a note, my fault. This is all my fault. I managed to get a hold of some of the code those bootlickers at the White Spring were using to integrate Modus. I thought I could upgrade Sodus with it. She was just so useless before. What's the point of having an AI run the facility if it takes hours to do simple tasks? God, I'm so sorry. And there it is. This explains why Sodus is trying to kill us and clearly killed all the Enclave here. She's suffering from the same AI personality quirks that Modus is. There are more Enclave bodies on the beds, a duffel bag beneath one, a first aid kit on another box, and that's it for this room. When done, we can leave this hallway by going through the southwestern door. Heading downstairs, we arrive in ankle deep water. We are now exploring the flooded section that the bathroom above was leaking into, and here we find Scorched. <gasps> Stepping inside, we can loot some of the various containers in this lounge area. We arrive in another hallway lined with more doors on either side. Task 151984, J. Jefferson. Disable security cameras in the mainframe core. Task denied. Again, JJ appears to have been one of the only Enclave soldiers here to realize what Sodus was doing. He tried to disable security cameras, but she blocked him. Opening the first door to the left, we arrive in a private bedroom. I'm thinking these are likely officers' quarters, as they appear to be a little bit nicer. Single beds instead of bunk beds. The door in this room leads to a bathroom. Nothing but toilet paper in the sink. Moving back out to the hallway, we can explore the next room to the left. Another bedroom. And here we find the water draining from the urinal in the bathroom above. This is the room it flooded into, and then went on to flood the rest of this lower level. The door in this room leads to a bathroom, and here we find... A scorched in the shower, of course. Back out to the hallway. We can open the door on the opposite side. Yeah, that was a scorched officer. On this officer's writing desk is a note. Glue sniffers. As soon as I find out which one of those glue sniffers is responsible for this, I'll have them drawn and quartered. Jones says we lost 85% of our potable water with that glitch of theirs. It's bad enough we've been eating recycled food for the past six years, but if I can't have my hot showers, there's going to be hell to pay. Is, is he saying that he thought the teddy bears did this? Or maybe that's a coincidence? And now we understand what that grinding machine was used for in the cafeteria. Any uneaten pink paste was dumped in, recycled, and then squirted out for future use. Ugh. We find a skillable two-locked safe against the wall by the table, and opening the bathroom door, we find the bathroom empty. Back out to the hallway. We continue east and open a double door that leads to another large hallway. We see one scorched. The door to the northwest is broken, so turning south and moving down the hallway, we find Comrade Chubbs lying in a linen basket. The door to the east is broken, but to the northeast, we find two single doors that lead to a larger room with a huge enclave symbol against a wall flanked by staircases. At the top of the platform is another scorched. <laughs> Climbing up the stairs. Warning, visitor detected in restricted area. Security, please assist. But security can't help you, Sodas. After eliminating the scorched officer, we can move behind the desk. Here we find a ruined door and another flickering sign. Visitor info, threat, not welcome, leave now, must dispose, stop, persist, end now, not tolerate, cease immediately. Is Sodas trying to talk to us through these signs? Moving west, we find another flickering sign by a coffee nook. And next to a Nuka-Cola machine, we find a door to the northwest that leads to what appears to be a war room. We arrive at an upper level here, but we hear... Check! A noise down below. Creeping around the corner, we find a scorched officer in power armor. 
Then two scorched scientists come out to play. Scorched finally dead, we can move inside to loot. Sadly, we can't walk away with any of this power armor. This guy was wearing X01, or advanced power armor. After looting the scrap on this platform, we can move down to the mezzanine level. We don't find any notes, but lots of bottles and scrap. Looks like the last thing the Enclave did is get drunk and throw their empties around. Then down to the next level, we find another Scorched. And here on a table, we find a note. Lost data. It's all gone. 15 years of data lost. I was able to recover fragments from our data buffers. The logs showed Sodas detected an unknown pathogen from above. She recalled the scouts and then completely wiped our systems. After that, she disabled our air filtration systems and started pumping an air straight from the surface. I have to stop her before she kills us all. So that's why we find Scorched here. Sodus pumped infected air into the bunker. Well, these poor guys never got access to the vaccine. Nuka-Cola, my blood's in it. So of course they all turned to Scorched. In the middle of this room, we find a console on this table, but I wanted to explore this bottom room first. We don't find anything. However, we do find a door leading out. We'll head that way in a minute. So back to this level, we can examine the transmission console. Warning! Unauthorized usage of this transmission console or any other communications device is strictly prohibited. Select Preset for Transmission Encoding. We can try to select the preset for Control Station Enclave, which, as we know from the events of Fallout 2, is an oil rig off the west coast of California. Error! Transmission controls disabled by mainframe. Please contact an administrator for assistance. Then we can try to select the preset from the White Springs Bunker, where of course we know Modus has been waiting, but we get the same error message. Finally, we can try a custom encoding, but this fails as well. Looks like we can't do anything with this terminal. Back downstairs, we can open the big double doors to arrive in another communications room. Lots of scrap on the tables, a duffel bag on a shelf, and against the northwestern wall, the administration console with a nearby hand scanner, which blinks red if we try to activate it, reading the administration console. Warning, usage of this administration console is restricted to members of HR and executive officers only. Please select an operation below. We could try to reset communication systems, but we see the same error message. So instead, we can try to register user for mainframe access. Please register your handprint with the scanner. Oh. Backing out, we can use the hand scanner. Registration successful. And it works. Now, we have mainframe access. We can pass through the hand scanner we found in the very first room with sodas. After we finish looting this room of its scrap, we can open a door to the northeast. This leads to a small room with scrap and a staircase leading up. At the end, we find, at last, a weapons workbench we can scrap down all the loot that we've found in there. And then turning around, we find another door locked with a hand scanner. Activating it puts us back in Sodus' room. And we can have a talk with her. Visitor, it is required that you leave immediately. Failure to comply will result in extermination. But now she is nothing more than empty threats. And so, our remaining task is to access the mainframe. Turning east, we see the mainframe door and the hand scanner. Activating it... ...opens the door. As we head down the hallway... Warning! Visitor has accessed mainframe. The others tried to shut me off, too. Their task failed. As will yours. What is that voice? It doesn't sound good. Paladin Romani and Knight Shin race to join us. At last, we can access that transmitter. But with Ramani and Shin here, 
What drama will unfold? Sadly, I'm all out of time. We'll have to explore exactly what happens in the mainframe room in my next episode. I publish new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter, at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, and YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos, and access to ox emojis that they can use in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. As we activate the transmitter to at last attempt to reach Elder Maxon at Lost Hills.